Working on a bank holiday Now I see why you cry You've been watching your best days slipping by Hello and welcome to the Wheels of Wisdom podcast where I set off on two wheels to talk to interesting people about interesting things and take on a challenge or two uh, into the bargain. So here we are at the second Wheels of Wisdom podcast. So I set off on a Boris bike, which uh, for those of you unfamiliar is London's Cycle for Hire scheme, where for a couple of pounds you can get a nice, heavy, overweight, slow bike uh, from one of a number of points and slog your way across the city. So it was a bitterly cold day, so it was actually a pretty good way for keeping warm. So I'm here with Craig Sterling for the second of the podcast. Following that great explorer Tom and our ride in Richmond, we're actually in Bunyan Fields Burial Ground, which is an appropriate place for a writer. We're looked over by Daniel Defoe and William Blake, and kind of it's one of those those areas of London that both myself and uh, Craig Sterling worked a few a few minutes away, and never visited, despite this great site that's been here since uh, the 17th century. Let's hope as we delve into his literary career that we don't hear the two of them turning in their graves. <laughs> <laughs> so, Crater, you so you studied English at Cambridge. I did. You studied poetry in the US yeah, under yeah. Derek a Wolcott. Nobel Prize yeah, winner, yeah, yeah. I believe. Yes, you released did. two poetry books. As three, well as three, three, three. Yeah, yeah. Two of which I have signed copies of and I've very much enjoyed and treasured over the years. <laughs> you were a literary reviewer for a number of broadsheets. Yep. And then you've gone completely off the rails into the world of popular fiction <laughs> with uh, Stealing Fire, which I used to summarise is sex, drink, violence and the arms trade. So I guess the obvious question is either what were you thinking or <laughs> what took you so long? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I've always loved James Bond and I love you know, Alan Quartermain stories and John Buchan and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I'd not be averse to a bit of Jackie Collins as well. And, you know, at the same time as I was studying Pilgrim's Progress, as, as it so happens, as I did at university, and, uh, you know, various kind of homiletic literature from the 14th century, I think I opted, I always wanted to be this kind of Beckett-style figure. And um, as time went on and I was reviewing for the TLS, Telegraph, people like that, and, you know, the books of poetry came out and I did the readings and so on and so forth. I just got a bit tired of it. And I think, you know, I wanted to give a full vent to, um, how could I put it, the kind of Barcelona stag do side of my personality. <laughs> and uh, stealing fire is the result. Yeah, so in terms of the research that you did for that, obviously the, the drinking, you had to tone down a bit for the book. But, <laughs> um, but how did you do it? I mean, was it through, through work? So I remember you saying yeah. you had some colleagues in the army, particularly yeah. around the, the arms trade. Was it through some yeah. of your... your, yeah. your your copywriting, well, day job as a copywriter. Yeah, well, all sorts. Um, day job copywriter, I wrote um, the spec for the Beyond Visual Range air to air missile for the MOD, uh, which is what led to, uh, gave me the idea of the missile. It's actually a friend of mine called Alex, who's an engineer, who. Um, who told me that it's now possible to have you know guys with first class degrees in mechanical engineering from Imperial College London, who are living in northwest Pakistan, basically will make you a microwave oven or a fridge on spec as long as you get them the plans. And that gave me the idea: what happens if they steal the plans for a missile? And yeah. uh, off we went. So that from that side. But I also did things um, uh, research into Rhodesia for the character of uh, Tertius Dice, who the mercenary. Um, I had to do an awful lot of desk research into that one. One of the things that I've always wondered about is when you are doing writing and you have close family and friends, and obviously some of the territory in which yeah. you go into into the book, and how much did you hear sort of your, your wife's voice, your mother's voice, as you write some of the more racy scenes? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, not so much that. In fact, the publishers edited down um, some of the... Uh, sexual content, shall we say, <laughs> um, which is a shame, uh, but you can see it's still pretty outrageous. In fact, it was more what I heard was the voices of people I've met through my working life. Some of the things that they said are actually reproduced in the book um, verbatim. 
so various bits of it are, are, um, are reproduced, reproduced from life. So I was kind of more thinking, I wonder what happens if X reads this, but mercifully none of them have yet. Is there an Andy Harris out there? So we both know an Andy, but yep. has some of those qualities. Yep. A, he's an amalgam of three people that I've met in my working life, one of whom is a friend. Uh, who was a Royal, the Royal Navy uh, systems engineer um, and who was booted out for uh, failing his uh, exams and who also broke, he broke up a fight between two ratings off the coast of Sierra Leone. But, he, but Andy Harris also has elements of other guys I've known who are ex-special forces and one guy in particular who I knew who was an arms dealer. Andy's habit of rolling his fags in, in the Navy style comes from that guy, for instance. So what is the, uh, the Navy style for rolling your cigarettes for the uninitiated? Well, apparently, you, you roll them with one fat end, so that if the wind's blowing into the cigarette, the, the tobacco doesn't fall out, apparently, so when you're on ship. One of the things that I've always respected about what you've been able to do with your, your writing is that there's a lovely punch cartoon whereby uh, there's uh, a guy at, sort of at, a, at, a, at a party saying, uh, oh, I pretend to be a writer, what do you pretend to be? <laughs> Whereas you've managed to hold down a, a full-time job, so now you have a, a wife, now you've baby. got a, a baby, a house to support, yeah. yet somehow you keep churning them out, churning them out. And in what what sort of see procrastination is is such a common problem for those that like to write. I mean, yeah. what's 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 been your your secret in terms of really being able to? To, to churn it out. Over the well, years. generally, I mean, it's the thing I've always wanted to do. So, you know, that has a that has a big influence. And I've always thought, you know, you and I both love blues players and stuff from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. None of these guys were full time musicians. They couldn't afford to be, you know. And yet, that was their passion. And so, I ju I've been inspired by them in part. And um, I think for this novel in particular, I'm kind of on record on the publisher's website as saying that, you know, I wanted this to be like something, a, a song by the faces of the Stones or ACDC, you know, just something that was f full, up, full on ahead. And I look around me, I just see loads of people who, who never give up. You know, there's, um, there's a young uh, London footballer, actually, who got canned by Birmingham City, went up to Aberdeen, left Aberdeen without a club and fought his way back into another club at a higher level and actually paid his own transfer fee. And I think that level of determination is so inspiring. You can't, you know, I don't understand people who say they can't find the time, however mm. difficult it is. You know, you've just got to keep going, basically. You, know, you get up two hours earlier in the day and you yep. before the day job and you just churn it out That's before it. the wife wakes up. Exactly. Yeah, and she used to hear me laughing through the walls. I mean, anyone who's read the book will know, you know, I was just, uh, when I was actually writing this stuff, I was thinking, yeah, you know, I'm going to do that one. <laughs> I just went after it, man. You know, yeah. just, I, was, I was testing myself to see how outrageous I could make it. Yeah. There's so many passages you could be referring to <laughs> from my reading. I'm quite sure I had to pin it down. Um, and how have you found and now? So there's a, a new addition in your in your life, which yep. actually means 5 a.m. starts for a different reason. So, yep. so I'm aware that you're working on a sequel, yep. Prophet's Tears. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Have you been able to still keep that same discipline with the tired um, and no. the other commitments? No, no. I mean. No, because the other stuff that's happened is that my next book of poetry, the fourth book, is currently with a publisher. So that's taken my attention off the off the thriller ball a bit. And um, obviously, uh, you know, our son is now 16 weeks old. So, uh, you know, I've uh, been spending some time with him and there's no need to tell you with two of your own what a revolution that is in your life. You yeah, know, what absolutely. an amazing experience. But I've, I am going back to it this weekend. I'm 15,000 words in. I'll be sending it. In fact, I may well send it to your good self for some comments. Oh, that's it. So one of the things that, that struck me when I was with the book, it, it does read like a film script. You yep. can picture the explosions. You've got, obviously, I'm sure Don, Johnny Depp's queuing up to play the lead, lead role of Andy Harris. <laughs> I thought and more Jared Butler myself. Jared but Butler, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I'm yeah. sure they'll be queuing up. Yeah. Was I understand that you've had some discussions around film rights. So yep. it, it'd be interesting, I'm sure people would be interested to know of how those how those conversations come around, and yeah. I, I believe it's shortlisted for Rome Film, the Rome Festival. Film yeah. Festival. Yeah, Price. I went to I went to Rome, yeah, and I met with ten producers, all of whom uh, said to me that it was going to be too big a budget for them, that they wouldn't be able to raise the finance. Although I have to say, I had more meetings than any other shortlisted book, and um, you know, the, the the obviously the film world is not great at the moment in terms of financing and stuff, but I'm. Um, about to talk to Europa Core, which is Luc Besson's film company, okay. uh, Icon Entertainment, uh, Working Title, and uh, Studio Canal Plus, um, who are all interested. Uh, excuse me, who would be in, Canal Plus would do it as a co-production kind of thing. 
but I don't really want to say too much with the attempt fate, but it was an amazing experience at the Rome Film Festival. I was two two rows behind Ennio Morricone and two rows in front of Michelle Yeoh and Richard Gere at the opening of Luc Besson's uh, The Lady, and I was walking down the red carpet with all these guys, you know, Boy George was about 50 feet behind me and all this sort of stuff. It was just awesome. I turned up in my dad's knackered old jacket and a t-shirt, thinking <laughs> I'd be let in a side door or something, but no, you know, there I was, glare of the cameras and all that, so uh, quite weird. Justin, so living up to the uh, the cliche of the of the uh, scruffy writer. Yeah, okay. <laughs> totally, un- totally unintentionally. I did buy a new pair of shoes because a guy was sh- staring at me in the hotel, and I kind of realised I had these scuffed shoes on. So I went out and spent 130 quid on a pair of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and, in, and in terms of getting that opportunity, I mean, is, is that something that occurs to a publisher, or do you, do you have an agent? I well, I don't, have, I don't have an agent at the moment. Um, I, the publisher put me up for the prize, um, and in the end, the prize wasn't awarded because no one actually got a deal um, coming out of this competition. And I guess the prize would go to, to, to a book that won a deal. There were 68 novels around Europe and 10 were shortlisted. Um, so it's a tremendous honour. There were only three from the UK. And as I say, you know, the, the, to be able to go to Rome and, you know, do the whole kind of film star bit was, uh, was really weird, you know. <laughs> yeah. so, so following up, what were you saying, were you touching there on, in terms of the health of the, the film industry? Yeah. In terms of that com- comment from Cameron about dumbing down yeah. the film industry, yeah. which... Um, was extremely badly received amongst the patrons. Isn't it? Yeah. What's your your view from as a as a writer in terms of the health of the publishing industry yeah. now? And yeah. I know that's one of the challenges that you've always faced over yeah. the years. Yeah. Is you know how to balance paying yeah. the bills with doing what you love. Yeah. And is there a, a sweet spot there between the two? Two touched on this with with Tom with his exploring. He yeah. has to has a, a multiple a multitude of different projects and yeah. tasks that pay the bills and allow him to do what he loves. I mean yeah. it's is it just that you know, 0.1 percent that achieve that and the rest of us find yeah. a way to do what we love? Or? Yeah, I mean that's an interesting question. I, I've had a meeting with Faber um, in the last couple of months since the book was published and their sales director uh, in a kind of look here sunny sort of way put four or five books on the table and pointed to them all and said, of these five authors, only one earns a living at it and they're all Faber and Faber authors you know I uh, said so you know you can pretty much kind of you know write off the idea but I, that doesn't really bother me I never expected to be able to earn a living um, from writing it always seemed to me that that was going to be a bonus you know and of course as you know you know my day job is kind of copywriting brochures and, and all this sort of stuff so it's just turning it on between nine and five for a different um for a different purpose really and, that, and I've, I've just kind of worked on that accommodation basically but in terms of you asked me about the health of the industry I think it's dire I think people are still trying to adapt to the uh, electronic environment I must say I saw my book on Kindle the other day and I'm a real fan I am a convert to the Kindle and to the digital technology so, so do you own a Kindle yet I, no I don't I'm for Father Christmas for that one. iPad iPad is going to be my thing and I'm waiting just uh, a couple of months I think for the, for the iPad you know. so yeah changes the dynamic of publishing in terms of being able to self-publish yeah. then there's the challenge of marketing and finding a, a following and it, yeah. too, it, it changes slightly the role of the publisher whether sometimes apple featuring you in yeah. ibooks is now that is now the publisher and so, absolutely right absolutely right it completely changes everything again you know as with itunes and with digital downloading i think but for me music has gone back to live performance now i don't think any musician expects to you know, kind of make their money out of record sales, certainly not in the beginning. And I think that's a very positive thing. I think if, if in the same way you may find that writing goes back to events and people, you know, and festivals and so on, I, I, I don't know how I feel about that because I think, you know, sitting there with a book is a very personal thing. That's what I do. I, I read alone, you know, or when, when I'm in bed with the missus at night or something. You know, I don't, I don't kind of, you know, I'm not a big fan of literary festivals and readings and so on. So interesting. I don't, I don't know how it's going to go in publishing. Yeah, but it's certainly in difficult straits at the moment. And, uh, actually, just got to jet off back to Scotland shortly after this. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna draw it to a close. You haven't you have brought some of the weather with you? It's extremely cold. Yeah, I don't know how but you guys put up with it down here. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. We, we do we do suffer in poor old London. So yeah. thank you once again to to Craig Sterling for making time to share some of his secrets and of course check check out the book on on Amazon. You yeah. will be amused. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, and that's about it for this podcast. So a big thank you once again to Craig Sterling and also to Marcus Hillier, who's generously allowed me to use his music in the podcast once again and who fittingly leads us out into the great unknown. Take it away, Marcus. To me, you are beautiful. Tired and close to tears